Well, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. I'm Tom Flaherty. I'm the Webster Town Supervisor. And for Webster citizens, you'll be happy to know that you're not going to hear me talking to this microphone for more than one minute. Um, you know, three weeks ago today, uh, Coca-Cola Fairlife uh, put out a press release that they were planning to build their next production facility for Fairlife here in Webster. And I think it's important to note that that's only 21 days ago, and the Coca-Cola Fairlife team, uh, totally on their own, this is voluntary, has worked with the town to say, we want to come to the town as early as possible in this process to have engagement meetings with the community. And I think it says a lot that they brought nine people in from really, as you'll see tonight when they present, all over the country from their facilities um, to do a presentation for you, then, but also then to answer any and all questions you have. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the microphone to uh, Lauren Craig from Coca-Cola. Right. Good evening, everybody. Um, I tried to say hello to as many of you as I could when you came in, but again, for those of you I might have missed, uh, I am Lauren Craig, Director of Public Affairs at the Coca-Cola Company. I am joined by this very uh, impressive team of folks that will be speaking to you tonight regarding the facility from across Fairlife, Haskell, and the Coca-Cola Company. Um, Again, my team's gonna talk us through this agenda here just from a very high level overview of the project to uh, give you a, a peek under the tent as to uh, what the site at this point uh, potentially will look like. And then um, arguably most important, we wanna give you all some time to ask us some questions. Before everyone else comes up, I just really do want to reiterate how excited we are that Webster is the preferred location for what will be Fairlife's largest production facility in the country. We also realize that that comes with a tremendous responsibility on our part, and um, we, we genuinely, in part, why we come out this early is we, because we want to make sure that we do not disrupt your community, your neighborhood, and that all we are doing is bringing value with jobs and ec economic development. So with that, uh, my colleague David is gonna come up and kick us off, and then I will be back again for, uh, for some Q&A. Thank you. Not David, my apologies. <laughs> Not David. Good evening. Uh, my name is Phil Lamoth. I'm the Senior Director of Manufacturing for Fairlife. Uh, I've been with Fairlife for six years, which you'll see the timeline is, uh, in Fairlife years, that's a long time. Um, we're still young, we're still growing, and, and most importantly, we're excited to be in Webster. So I'd like to, to start with a little bit about our background, who we are, um, to give you guys some context of um, of our vision and our mission. So ultimately, we're a group of, of folks that believe in better. And we really do believe in the power uh, of dairy nutrition. We're focused on bringing nutrition to the world, uh, both macronutrients, so high protein, low sugar, and, and micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals that sustain life. Um, and so, what we're trying to do is, is to unleash that, uh, that nutrition and, and really provide people uh, with what they need. You know, my kids drink our chocolate milk every day. Uh, we've got occasions for our products throughout um, everybody's life, whether you're, you're working out or you're replacing a meal or you're recovering from surgery. So we're excited. Uh, we, we really truly believe that we're, we're doing something to, to make a difference. Our products, uh, and hopefully you grabbed one on the way in. If not, there's plenty back there. We've got core power and nutrition plan on ice back there. So grab one or two on the way out. Um, but what we make is really ultra-filtered milk. Uh, our flagship, uh, the trademark brand, that, that blue bottle right there is, is our Fairlife trademark. It's, it's ultra-filtered. Essentially what that means is we're, 
filtering out the lactose, we're concentrating the protein, and ultimately you, it, it provides us with a product that our consumers are looking for with less sugar, more protein. We take care of our milk through the whole process. It's, it's maintained at a cold temperature through the whole process. We're obsessed with quality and making sure that we're delivering an ultra premium product. We also have core power. So core power is high protein after a hard workout. It's a, a great shake for, for uh, athletes or for somebody that you know just went on a run. Um, but it also tastes great, so we're, we're also committed to making sure that we've got great tasting products. And the Nutrition Plan is our latest brand, and that product is more of a meal, meal replacement, low calorie. You can find it in our club channels, Sam's Club or Costco, and that's really a, a high growing brand. So we love being able to provide nutrition uh, to people, and this gives us the opportunity to do that more. We have uh, multiple different facilities, and Webster being our third one will give us a chance to, to produce more for customers that are looking for our products. So I'll take you back in time a little bit and um, a, a, more about our story. So we, we started with Core Power, the the recovery protein drink, and we, our uh, founders were actually making that in New Mexico. They were shipping it to a bottler, uh, to a, a bottler up in uh, the Midwest. And what we realized really quickly was that if we're committed to high quality and controlling the process and making sure we can make a premium product, we need to make the manufacturing as well. We need to make it in-house and really master that craft. So we started the Coopersville, Michigan plant in 2013. Uh, I've run that plant for a few years now. We're celebrating our 10 year anniversary and we still have employees in that building from that first, uh, that first day, um, getting able, being able to celebrate with them uh, the accomplishments in, in the next chapter of Fairlife. But that wasn't enough. We're growing at such a rate we needed to open up a new facility uh, we chose Goodyear, Arizona. That plant has been operating for the last two years. It is a state-of-the-art, uh, high innovation uh, manufacturing facility, uh, still ramping up in production. But that's not enough. We're, we're growing at such a rate where we need a third plant, and that's where you come in, Webster. So we're excited about this area. Uh, there's high quality milk in the region. There's a lot of top talent the, the industry, the innovation, the technical experience, the work ethic is, is all attractive to us. So we're excited to um, bring some jobs to the area and continue on our journey. With that, I'll hand it over to David to walk through some of the details on the project. Hi, y'all. Um, I am Marissa Haig. I am the Director of Animal uh, Welfare and Sustainable Farming for Fairlife, and that's just a really fancy title that I'm just a cow veterinarian. Um, so I get to work with our supplying farms, and as much as we're excited about coming to Webster, we want Webster to be excited about us. So I wanted to share a little bit about how Fairlife gives back to the communities. So um, all of our employees, and really from the top down, you guys can see up there in the corner in the blue shirt, that's Tim Dolman, that's our CEO, super committed to being in, in the communities and giving back. Um, we have lots of volunteer um, hours within our organization and grant um, local grant winners within the areas that we have a footprint. Um, last year alone, we donated over $250,000 into our grant programs. A lot of those are um, community gardens, um, food distribution, and things like that that are aligned with our company. And so again, we look forward to being a good neighbor and a partner within your community. Okay, now I think it's time. <laughs> All right, finally. Uh, my name is David Mann. I'm a senior director of supply chain strategy at the Coca-Cola Company. 
Um, I work with uh, brands in our system on supply chain infrastructure development. Um, we've partnered with Fairlife on this new facility, and I wanted to talk about a couple of the highlights uh, at a high level um, of the project before we dig into some of the details on the, on the site. So over the last 12 months, we've gone through a, a very competitive multi-state site selection process. Phil alluded to a lot of the reasons why we chose uh, Webster, um, and we're excited to be here. The production facility is expected to be about 750,000 square feet, which includes production, warehousing, and office space, and it'll sit on a property that's a little bit over 100 acres. We're expected to employ um, approximately 250 positions, inclusive of management, engineering, technicians, operators, and other administrative roles, um, like HR, training and safety, continuous improvement, and finance. Uh, one of the big um, advantages or benefits of a Fairlife production facility is that we source the raw material locally, uh, the raw material being the, the raw milk. Um, the, a plant of this size and scale uh, would, would uh, consume about 5 million pounds of dairy per day, just to give you an idea, and that milk comes within the local area. Typically, we source within 100 miles. So you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, it gives you an idea of the radius of 100 miles uh, of Webster and, and essentially where we would target um, raw milk from, from local farms here in the upstate New York area. Uh, on the top right, this is a, a view of our network. So Phil talked about Coopersville and Goodyear, uh, the proposed Webster facility. It, we wanted to show the, the, the area that it would service, which is largely the, uh, the Northeast and, and throughout the East Coast. With this facility, we're looking to make a $650 million investment um, in Fairlife and in the Webster area. Um, that's our expected uh, capital investment in this uh, manufacturing plant. In terms of where the facility will be located, we've got a map here on the, the left-hand side of the screen that shows its proximity um, in terms of being on the eastern uh, side of the town of Webster. Uh, in an industrial zoned area. Um, what you'll see here further on the right is the, the, the truck path to the, the, the Tibor Road site, um, which is off of Highway 104, uh, up Salt Road into Boulder Industrial Parkway through Tibor Road. Uh, through a proposed uh, expansion of Boulder Industrial Parkway, our understanding is that the town's been, been looking at this um, as a proposed extension, and it offers us uh, an opportunity to have a, a truck path that minimizes uh, uh, driving near residences. I'll hand it over to Darren next, who's gonna walk us through a little bit uh, more information on the actual site itself. Good evening, Darren Ward. Director of Engineering for Fairlife. I've been within the Coke system now for close to 28 years. Um, managed to be in fortunate position to build some factories around the world for Coca-Cola, and I'm super excited to be coming here to build what will be an absolute flagship facility for the Fairlife team. What we have in front of us is really our very first conceptual try at, at, at our building, so it's obviously subject to some further change. But at the same time, I just wanted to give you some orientation around the building itself. I've got a little laser pointer. <laughs> Truck facilities here coming in, milk receiving here, milk silos, production area, warehouse, and full goods receiving. So our employees will come in on this road and the trucks and tankers will come in on this road. As David mentioned, it's 750,000 square feet facility with uh, state-of-the-art equipment on the inside and uh, just over 110 acres. I think the overriding message for us to be here today is what do we do to become a good neighbor in this community? So if right from the get-go, it's our job to make sure when we design this facility, we design it in a way that makes us a good neighbor. So right off the, 
right away we're thinking about minimizing the amount of light that comes from our facility, making sure it points inwards and is low. We don't want to see light pollution for our neighbors or our community. Purely from a road point of view, you can see the truck path wraps around the perimeter of the building and that's done on purpose to make sure that we can keep the milk trailers off of the road and minimize any road congestion. And obviously, from a sound point of view, we don't wish to encroach on our neighbors. So you'll see that the milk receiving is fully enclosed. So we bring our tankers in, close the doors, empty the milk. And as you can also see, they don't reverse out. They carry on forward and back out of the property. Obviously, the, uh, the construction, you know, we will do our best to minimize dust and debris and noise and make sure that we sit within the ordinance hours when it comes to construction. Just a very rough project timeline. Obviously, everything's subject to permitting, but um, if things go well, we'll start breaking ground in October of this year. Um, depending on the New York weather, how much work we achieve during the winter of this year. But we'll be constructing all the way through 2024. And then come 2025, we'll be starting to bring our equipment in, and the equipment will take about six months to install and commission, and our hope is to be up and running in the Q3 of 2025. Hopefully that gives us a good overview of the project and why we're here, and as a team, we'd love to answer any questions that, the, that you may have. I think, uh, I think there's microphones available. Oh, they're right here. Uh, I have a question about milk and cows. Five million pounds, is that about 700,000 gallons? Because I, I always think of milk in gallons. You pick up a jug, and I think that's seven or eight pounds. Anyway, you can think about that one. What's the impact on all the dairy farmers? Are there enough farms and cows or, around? Or do they have to, will they be expanding their capacity? And will they be... What's the impact on the people they supply now? Yeah, that's a really great question. So we looked, um, that was our number one um, thing that we looked at when we were looking to build a new plant was where could we get a supply of milk that was high quality, met our, would meet our animal welfare standards and would be great partners. And upstate New York was where we found that would be the best place to come. Um, so historically, we're working with local dairies already established here and their co-ops to supply us milk. Um, that might, milk might have been one being, you know, used for powder or something else, which they don't get as high a premium for as they do fluid milk. So this could create a new, higher paid market for those dairy farmers. Um, and then historically in this region, it's, they've had a, maybe excess milk. So this will allow fa some farms maybe to expand a little bit, bring maybe a son or daughter home to that farm and expand. So we're hoping that that creates opportunity for dairy farmers in this region. Roughly, how many cows does it take to produce five million pounds a day? <laughs> uh, we're looking at probably ooh, 10,000 cows to 15,000 cows. Yeah, and those are already in this region. Could you talk about the waste products that you will be that you make and uh, what you will do with them? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have three different byproducts from our process. Uh, the raw milk comes in, it's separated to skim and cream. We use some of the cream in our products, but a lot of it will sell back. So we'll load that cream, um, we'll heat treat it and load it and send it to um, creameries, or other facilities that can use it. We also have lactose as a byproduct. We filter out the lactose, it's not desirable, um, but it is a great source of energy. It's kind of basically sugar water. We'll, we'll truck that lactose back to the farms and our farmers will actually use that in their feed as a supplement. So really full circle sustainability when it comes to 
the byproduct going back to the farms. And then third is water. We, we filter and concentrate milk, so we're left with a lot of water. That filtered water we use to actually clean our process. So uh, it allows us to use less water, use our resources wisely. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, the question I have is regarding the mRNA technology that the Chinese have just developed, and they use a milk bubble, um, administering it to mice, and that in the mammals um, is used to produce antibodies to whatever the mRNA technology is, is being implemented against. So my question to you is, are these animals and or their feed going to have mRNA technology introduced? So I can answer this question as a veterinarian. Uh, no, none of our animals are vaccinated with an mRNA vaccine. There are no approved mRNA vaccines for cattle in the United States. And if they were, were, were they'd have to go through the FDA and be proof safe. And then Additionally, um, no vaccine has been shown to transfer into meat and milk, so they're all completely safe. It wasn't necessarily a vaccine. It yeah. was being introduced into the feed supply of the animals. So, no. The answer is no. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I heard that the, the facility needs 1.2 million gallons of water uh, for production on a uh, daily basis, and I heard you just mention that uh, you extract a lot of water and send it out. I'm just a, a little confused. What, what's 1.2 million gallons used for production on a daily basis? Yeah, that's a great question. So we use all of our filtered water that we can, uh, but ultimately it's not enough to to wash or sanitize all of our processes. So we will pull in water from the city. That volume I don't think is, is clear yet. We're doing some studies to understand what that volume will be. But we'll use that for boiler makeup water. We'll use it for tower water or, or cooling, cooling loops and then for, for any additional sanitation needed. And then that goes back into the, the sanitary system, obviously. Correct. So. Uh, opening a plant in Arizona, did you need that level of water in Arizona too, or is it a different kind of uh, facility? Yeah, so we, we pull in city water into Arizona, not quite at that volume though. Um, and, and we're pulling in um, for all of those same sources, for boilers, uh, cooling, cooling tower, and sanitation. Last question. How many ounces of milk does it take to generate this 12 ounce, uh, 30 gram protein drink? A gallon? I'm, it's, I would, it's about two, 2.4 times uh, oh, the okay. volume, oh, okay. but it's yeah. based on the product, so it varies. Marissa said 2.8. I think core power and nutri nutrition plan are right there, but we concentrate significantly to, to harness that nutrition. Yep. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. How many trucks usually go in and out on a day? Is this one? Yeah. Um, we're currently in the process of a traffic study. It's obviously part of the uh, permitting process. So the honest answer is we don't actually know quite yet because it depends on the mixture of the size of the milk tankers as well, which we're negotiating right now as we go through it. So as we go through the public forum of permitting, one of the things that will be shared obviously will be the traffic analysis and at which at that point you're going to see it very, very detailed almost by the hour. Do 
Yes, I'd like to know uh, how much of this is being funded by Coca-Cola and how much of this is being aided by state or national or even local grants and relief? Yeah, so, uh, so it's a $650 million investment. Uh, and then from an incentives perspective, very much, uh, you know, as we noted earlier, we did, uh, this was a very competitive project and we did talk to many different states. We did receive incentives for this project from the state to your point. Um, and then uh, we are also working, Monroe County is also working with the state on potential IDA investments as well. You can't, can't give us any dollar amount or percentage? Sure, so, so 20 million came from the state uh, with the commitment for the 250 jobs. And then Monroe County uh, via the state will also be per, uh, supporting with 21 million in infrastructure investments. Thank you. I think Webster is a great place for your site because you have unlimited 36 degree water three miles away and you, Webster is producing a brand new or completely upgraded sewer system. So this, the other thing you got is a lot of electricity. So this is a great place, and I'm glad you found us. Uh, another company just found us called Tessie, and they bought a bunch of the Xerox property, to, and they're a plastic injection molding company, an international company with local roots. Um, where are your bottles being made? Right there on Basket Road or across the street at Tessie? Or are you bringing in empty bottles? Yeah, so currently uh, our, we call them preform supplier, our injection molding suppliers. Uh, we've got multiple suppliers. Um, one of them is a part of the Coca-Cola network. Uh, but we're bringing in uh, preforms from as far as South Carolina, Ohio, Chicago, land area. But injection molding is always um, a great opportunity. So looking forward to, to uh, hopefully tapping into to local industry. It needs vast amounts of electricity and cold water. So you're, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Great, thank you. Somebody asked a question about the number of trucks. Uh, five million pounds a day works out to about 125 trucks carrying 20 tons each. And uh, that's a lot of trucks. And um, you might think about some of them getting off at Basket Road and coming in. It's a little bit shorter, and you could split up the, uh, the traffic a little bit. But as you said, you haven't done the study yet, so. But there's a lot of trucks. And just uh, as we continue to work through these studies, our commitment to you all is that we'll continue to share this information as it becomes available to us. We know that's an important question. Is this a seasonal business at all? Do the Cows produce the same amount of milk year-round, and do you produce the same volume of output uh, year-round, or does it fluctuate a little bit by the season? And so, will the employment be steady all year, or will the employment be up and down? Nope. So uh, no, no seasonality here, especially in the Midwest. You will see some seasonality in dairy in, in the deep south, so Florida, Georgia, those states. But here we have consistent supply all year long, and we have the same um, amount of labor all year long. You're not using enzymes to get rid of the lactose, you're filtering it? 
So we're, we're filtering out as much lactose as we can physically, and then that small residual lactose, we do add uh, some lactase enzyme just to eliminate any residual so that anybody that's insensitive or sensitive to it or intolerant to lactose doesn't have an issue. Any baby product or formula or any, how old are the people drinking this? Are they six years old and up? Or is there a baby or a child product line? Yeah, hopefully, hopefully uh, infant nutrition in the future. Right now we're gonna stick to our, uh, our core products, but I'll tell you my two-year-olds drink uh, plenty of our chocolate milk. And just to announce, the reason why we need you to be on the microphone for the questions is that where it's great that you all came out tonight, there's a very good chance over the next month that 20 fold that are here tonight will watch this video on channel 1303 or on our website. So they would not be able to hear that question unless you're on the microphone, all right? Okay, so I did some math, and I just want to fact check. It'll be around 50,000 cows that'll be supplying our plant. I apologize. I got nervous. <laughs> How does this plant um, size compare to the other two? Yeah, it, it will be our largest plant. So right now in, in Michigan, we have 320 employees and we're looking to expand that plant, but this plant will, uh, when it's said and done, will produce the most products out of any of our sites. Volume-wise, can you give us a ratio? I don't know if we have a, a volume number just yet. I'm waiting for, for Darren and the engineering team to, to give us that. Yeah, just for reference, we're, we're at about 4 million pounds a day at our Michigan site, about 2.5 million pounds a day in, in Arizona. This plant will exceed 5 million pounds a day. From a uh, dietary standpoint, you might have some numbers on this. Uh, th this is a, a 30 grams or 40 or 50 grams of protein. Uh, I get, I'm under the understanding that the American public is vastly uh, underfed when it comes to protein right now. Do you have any statistics on how bad that number is? Because this is a huge marketing, uh, I mean, serving that need uh, is, just an excellent uh, idea. So uh, how, how bad is our protein consumption right now? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a good product. Uh, that's not my expertise. I wish it was. I know what I said. I mean, I'm more in cow nutrition, but I try to answer this. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think the average, uh, you know, American adult is supposed to be getting 100 to 120 grams of protein a day, and they're just not meeting that need. It's, it's quite hard, right? Um, so I, I'm not a nutritionist, and, I, and we don't have our sales team here with us today, so I can't answer that. But that really what fuels us at Fairlife is being able to provide that high quality nutrition to the world at a reasonable price, and so that's really what our goal is here. And if I could just add to that too, um, as Marissa noted earlier, we of course do so much in the community, and so part of this process for us too, as we become ingrained in, the, in this community, is understanding where that need is. And so um, if you have recommendations on you know, nonprofit partners or other community partners that we could work with to make contributions to or to donate to, please share that with us. I'll, I'll, I'll even add to that too. So when we work with local food banks and communities, one of the number one asks for products at food shelters is milk. Families are looking for milk. And so this is something that we, you know, we, we're really involved with. This is three times is protein laden as normal milk. Correct. So it go a long way in the city schools and everywhere else if uh, they're drinking it, I would think. It's a, yeah, okay.
Could you tell me typical, typical cost for, for this drink? And could you also say what the cost would be for a gallon of your product compared to a gallon of milk that we can go buy at Wegmans? Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, I don't have my calculator with me. But um, yeah, we can't disclose our, our total cost at this point. I'm not asking for the cost to make it. What's it cost for me to go to a store? Oh. And buy this. That's a that's also a good question. For that for that core power, that's probably uh, depending on if you're buying it. And do you have it? I say I was saying three fifty to four dollars. If you're in the airport, maybe a little more. Three forty nine. Just to reiterate uh, what Matt said, Wegman sells it for three forty nine. Okay. You referred to a milk product. You sell just a milk. And what, what does that cost in a store? Is that more or less than just regular milk today? Yep, so our ultra-filtered milk, uh, it's not traditional milk, but we do a, a whole milk, 2%, and, and skim milk. Um, but as mentioned, it's value added, so it's twice the protein. 50% um, more protein, 50% less sugar. So that means if I'm paying Two fifty three dollars for a gallon of milk here. I'm going to pay twice that for a gallon of your product. Yeah, closer to, to five fifty. Thank you. I, I just have one comment on that. I just want to add that although it is more expensive, it has a much longer shelf life. So even though you're paying more for it, you're not throwing it out in ten days. That's exactly right. Thank you. You're coming before the town board for your first time soon, and um, there'll be all the processes that you'd have to go through with permitting and meeting all the specs that they'll require. I'm assuming that you're working together well in advance of those meetings so that you are able to be prepared to do and we are prepared to do what needs to be done to make this happen that's a kind of a rhetorical question but <laughs> i'm hoping i'm sure that's all taking place yeah good evening i'm i'm joshua i'm with the uh, the haskell company and you are right we are actively working with the town uh, going through all the uh, the requirements and then working with them on all the designs to make sure that everything is coordinated and that we meet all the deadlines and all the guidelines. So all of that is happening behind the scene before those meetings. Is there anything that the community can do to um, promote the engagement of your uh, business in our community, um, you're presenting something, but there's a whole community out here who really will benefit from you being here, and you will benefit from us understanding fully what it is that you offer here. And I'm just wondering if there's something from the community itself, not just from the town, that would be helpful to you in promoting this effort. And maybe that's a town board issue as well, because this is a, this is a big deal for the community. And uh, maybe looking at it a little bit different might be helpful to be sure that roadblocks, um, and I'm thinking, uh, I was mentioning outside earlier, that we had a, um, a developer just pull out of a 16 year project, in a 16 year long project in Pittsford, saying that all of the things that had to be done and it came down to a vote, and one person made the difference. And they said, we've had enough. And millions of dollars had been spent, and away they went. So the, com the developer doesn't benefit, nor the does, the does the community benefit. So there's a symbiotic relationship that can develop, but looking at it maybe from a different perspective, and maybe in your area of expertise, 
that might be something that's looked at in a little different way to entertain the community benefit? Yeah, so I, for any of my colleagues who might have something to add, please do. I, I would say my first response to your question is you doing what you are doing right now. The fact that you came to this room, that you're spending the time on a Tuesday after, uh, Tuesday evening rather, to hear our presentation, to ask us these thoughtful questions. I, I mentioned this to someone earlier uh, before we started, but I think the one really you know big best practice lesson learned with all of the expertise up here over the years is that meetings like this are really critical early on in the process because this is your home. You you know it, the neighbors that you know that back up against the land, like they know this community well. We spoke to a gentleman earlier who's been here for 50 plus years. I mean, we, we need to hear from you so that we can learn more about the things we just might not know. So, so to answer your question, I mean, we thank you all for coming out on a Tuesday night to speak with us and ask us these questions. And I think the only thing that we would ask in return is please keep doing it and know that, you know, we know trust is earned and we're gonna keep working to ensure that we prove to you all that we deserve to be here, not only that we wanna be here. Is there anybody else? That... Okay. Any final takers? <laughs> Okay. Well, with that, thank you all so much. We genuinely, we mean it. Thank you for coming and we appreciate your support. Thank you.